other people who teach in this tradition, there's very little stress about how, how I feel about this. Like it's though that's not your motive. And that is an important point. The motive is usually to understand. It's to know, not to feel. And so it's this inquiry doesn't really let itself be sidetracked very easily into getting you to feel better. It's not easy to derail this inquiry. Um, what will happen is if a person has the motive of wanting to feel better, this inquiry or this line of approach just won't seem very relevant. It just won't resonate with the person. They'll look at it and say, well, how can this make me feel less anxiety or something? And over a long period of time doing inquiry, you might feel less anxious, but if being less anxious is your main motive and you are anxious, there are many, many, many ways to cut down your anxiety real quickly, you know? Psychotherapy, doing the things that our grandmothers said to do, like go to bed early and take, your, you know, take plenty of liquids and you know, eat your vitamins and you know, don't get in trouble and stuff like that. They're really helpful to not feel anxious. But doing an inquiry like this is so subtle that it's like that image of a little bird who comes and flutters its wing on a great boulder once every thousand years. How long will it take that boulder to be worn away? That's what doing this inquiry would, it's about the same, doing this inquiry in order to get rid of a feeling of anxiety or hatred or something. But if you do it in order to want to know the truth about your existence, then it's very direct. It's very efficacious, very quickly. How does this, how does this affect your involvement with the world or your sense of, uh, sense of interaction with others or anything to do with uh, kind of uh, maybe looking at the pieces on the table that were objects before? Well, then I have to go back and choose a language, I choose a conceptual scheme. Right. Because we had sort of left off with there not being any gap between subject and object and no duality at all. So let's choose a language that matches what you asked, right. your very question. Right. And so that's more like everyday psychological or everyday just everyday talk. Um, people told me I became kinder and more chilled out. Um, at the time, I had a girlfriend who was a lot younger than me, and she was uh, monogamously challenged. So she was always cheating on me. And yet I didn't feel angry or embittered. I felt um, just sort of like open and benevolent. I didn't want it to continue, you know, but so we ended up breaking up because I wanted a monogamous relationship and she didn't. But we remained friends and we're friends to this day. That's an example of something that probably wouldn't have been possible before that point in time. And I started caring about other people in a way that I never had before because in my family, <clears throat> we weren't raised with a strong sense of ethics or a strong sense of uh, concern or compassion for other people. And I was very interested in learning this for myself after that because I didn't see any, any reason that the world had to rotate around a Greg anymore. Like, you know how parents sometimes say, you think the world owes you a living, you know? I didn't, I didn't have that feeling. So I thought, I sort of became open-hearted and like a sense of my heart expanding towards other people and wanting to do what I could to, to help in any way or to, to be kinder, to be more open to be more helpful, even in bumbling, unskillful ways, you know, at first, and hopefully better later, you know. And then was there a certain point where you attended more of your energies to that, or did that just seem kind of like uh, almost irrelevant? It actually became more and more important, uh, because other stuff wasn't important, like career or like ambition or things like that was not an issue with me so I never formally um, 
let's see, I don't really know. Later, I started um, devoting more and more and more time to talking to other people about this. Um, it's not the same as joining the Peace Corps and going and you know, feeding hungry people. It's something that um, I was sort of naturally drawn to. And I started devoting more and more time to that, to the point where <clears throat> I later got married and my wife said, um, you should do this more formally. And so I did endeavor to do that in a more formal way. So, like right now you're just talking from a different perspective maybe um, of the teachings mm -hmm. and it's interesting to me um, because I think a lot of people when they hear a really um, subtle teaching mm -hmm. they immediately try to apply it to all aspects of their experience and just mm -hmm. cut off everything like no people, they don't want to see anything arise, mm -hmm. so they <laughs> look at a blank wall or whatever, you know, go, yeah. to, a, go yeah. to a place where there's nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how do you, can you talk about that? Yes. Um, there's a difference between, you know, different teachings have different ways of, of bearing upon that very issue that you mentioned. In the Advaita Vedanta tradi tradition, they talk about the absolute versus the relative levels. Um, in Buddhism, they talk about the conventional truth versus the ultimate truth. And you can talk about it in terms of, I think in Western terms, it's very, uh, I think very revealing to talk about it as um, the difference between literal and figurative language. That when people hear a teaching like that from a very subtle standpoint, they take it literally, as though it's literally true. I knew, a, I knew of a friend who once who wanted a girlfriend, and he, he was a follower of these Advaitic kind of approaches. And so he said, I'm gonna stay in my apartment <clears throat> and let consciousness bring me a girlfriend. I'm not gonna do anything on my own, I'm just gonna let consciousness do everything. And so I was a member of a dating club at the same time. And so I was like actively going and meeting people and calling people up. And I said, I'm doing the same thing. So that's a difference in how a person interprets letting consciousness do something for themselves. Like is, are you treating consciousness as a literal entity or being? or are you treating it as all that arises? So treating it as all that arises is a more figurative, metaphorical, kind of more open-ended way of approaching it. It's less restrictive. So I think as you pursue these non-dual approaches, the good ones, they teach you how to treat language in different ways. Um, I remember one Advaita Vedanta teacher saying, Yes, there's the relative and the absolute approach in Advaita Vedanta, and you become proficient at switching levels whenever you need to, sometimes even in the same sentence. And so it becomes kind of like an expedient skill, an expedient means to communication with someone else. And I would always try to switch levels like that in a compassionate way that to help the person I'm talking to or to, to make for harmony sake or for openness and for the sake of love. So, but there is, there is that, that ability to, to talk from different levels. And you can look at them as different levels of literalness or figurativeness in language.